Hello, I'm Judy Bailey, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce you now to the Independence Middle East correspondent, Dr. Robert Fisk. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, you're based in Beirut, I know, but you're currently in Dublin. What are you doing there? Um, I'm sitting here writing at the moment page 1670 of the manuscript of my new book, which will be called Night of Power, and it's about the most recent years in the Middle East, especially the Syrian war. So that's what I'm actually doing um, as I, a few minutes ago before I came to speak to you, downstairs from here. So you're in the halls of academia, are you, in, in, uh, in Dublin, doing that? Well, I'm actually uh, in my own home here at the moment, but um, this is where I'm, uh, I'm writing my book at the moment, because um, uh, I'm still writing you know, two or three times a week for, for my paper about the Middle East, but there's an opportunity for me to actually finish this huge book of mine and then get back as soon as possible to Beirut. Now, it's an, it's an interesting role reversal for you, isn't it, to be the subject of somebody else's storytelling. Um, I wondered if you learned anything about yourself during the course of making this movie. Yeah, well, I have, I have been in other films, and they have made a film about my work um, uh, some uh, 25 years ago, uh, which was shown on Channel 4 and the Discovery Channel in the States. I didn't like making that very much. I quite like this one. My first reaction on seeing the film was that I thought I went on and on and on. I thought, my God, I can hardly stand to listen to any more Fisk. How can the viewer possibly stand it? You know, who hasn't even known me before. Um, I thought I was, I, I thought I came across as extremely verbose and rather dull. And I suppose to some extent, you see, I'm repeating things I've many times thought about in the past and therefore to me, I was not repeating myself, but it was familiar territory. I have but to I say, I do disagree. I have to chip in here. <laughs> I realised when I saw the first uh, premiere at the Toronto Festival, and I was watching it, and the audience were obviously wrapped by it, and coming up afterwards, and, you know, glad handing me and slapping me on the back, and they obviously saw it as being something very new. Um, and I was quite surprised that it was so warmly received, as it has been in many other places, including in Amsterdam. Um, I, I think there are several reasons for that. One is that um, the film was not a biography of me and it wasn't intended to be. It included quite a lot of archive material, even me as a little boy <laughs> with parents, uh, even you know pictures of my father in the First World War, not the Second, the First World War. Um, and also I think um, Yang Chang, the director, brought it together very skillfully in that he was trying very hard to, um, to make it a film that moved backwards and forwards in time, which is very much where I think my job is. I, I keep reminding myself that virtually every country I go to in the Middle East is the victim of the Treaty of Versailles, which followed my father's First World War. Um, and that, um, you know, because of the Second World War, uh, the existence of the State of Israel, which may or may probably would not have come about in 19... 48 if it hadn't been for the Jewish Holocaust in Europe and that in many ways I'm reporting and seeing things which are the direct result of the first and second world wars and because my father was very interested in history and I inherited his huge um, library of books on the first and second world war you know I, I knew a lot about the first world war by the age of 10 I could have told you who got assassinated in Sarajevo in 1914 um, and I think that for that reason um, uh, the film sort of married up the way I think about my own work and that way was interesting. The other thing was that uh, Derade was a great camera man and a great guy to work with. I, I found that after a while, you know, films aren't shot all sequentially. The crew goes away and then some of them come back then the director's away and he comes back. And I found that when I was back working on my own in Syria or wherever, I actually quite miss them. I look forward to them coming back to join the adventure, you know, because journalism should be a sort of adventure. Yeah. Although it's a, you know, it's a pretty grim one, I suppose. Um, and I noticed that when Young first came to, um, to Beirut, first of all, he didn't wear a black shirt, which I was very pleased to see. I hate all directors in black shirts. Most directors what? I know. But... 
Uh, and it's all right, you're not a direct, well, it's, it's not a shirt. Um, and the second thing was that unlike most Western journalists who arrive in Lebanon or Egypt or wherever and start telling the people what is happening to them, Young just sat and listened to Lebanese Syrians talking to him and just absorbed what they said and took notes in a little notebook, as I take notes in a real notebook with a pen. You know, I don't clash away on laptops when I'm talking to people. I think it even feels rude to do that. And he, he thought about things. He didn't talk, he listened. And that slightly endeared his way of working to me because it's what I try to do. And certainly I use a notebook and a pen. And you see me, of course, in the film constantly holding my, you see me writing in my notebooks and you see the huge file and archives. Um, the, the files you see are actually here below me in did the floor you, below, which you, you see in the film. Yeah. Did you set any parameters around the filming? Were there certain no-go areas? No, um, I said that I would not talk about my private life because I never do. And um, private life is private, full stop. Um, Apart from that, I think the only thing I said, and Young entirely accepted it, was that um, wherever we um, filmed, it was up to him whether he filmed it or not, whether it was terrifying, whether people were weeping or not, it was up to him, but that I wasn't going to redo scenes. I wouldn't drive around a corner again or restart an interview. Um, I noticed, I, I used to use the word faffing, which crews always faff, you know, they're always saying, oh, just a minute, Bob, it's the wrong lens, you know. Um, although sometimes I run out of ink, so I faff too, you know. Um, and just once or twice I'd say to, you know, Young, when he was faffing with some camera lens, come on, we've got to get going. And I used to say to him at the beginning, if you don't get it, I'm not going to do a second run for you. It's all got to be real. And it is real. And, and it shows because you can't, uh, although there are some scenes in it, like the guy who suddenly says, that's my signature, I sent the weapons to Saudi Arabia, which are glorious. I mean, it's what every journalist dreams. And there it was on film. Um, I couldn't believe it. You can actually see the look of uh, astonishment. I tracked this guy down in less than a day. and I'd come with the documents from Aleppo in Syria. And I found him in Bosnia. Um, except, um, and that was, you know, we had the camera running. Thanks be to God. Otherwise, I wouldn't have rerun it. And I had this experience with a previous film I made called From Beirut to Bosnia, the one I was telling you about earlier, 25 years ago, where the director, the, the late Mike Duckfield, he, he died shortly after making the film The Road Accident, but he would always say, Bob, I don't think my 82-year-old grandmother will understand what you're talking about. Can you explain that a little bit more simply? And I began to feel very sorry for his 82-year-old grandmother, who I suspect probably would have understood it quite well. And it wasn't, you know, as we, that old cliche, dumbing down. It was just that he, he didn't want any tiny bit of the film to be inconclusive. So he'd constantly say, look, Bob, we're going to start filming in 15 minutes. Would you then drive around the corner? And then if by chance I drove around a corner behind a truck, he said, you're going to have to go and do it again. We couldn't see you. So now you see, in my... Yeah. You see, from, from, from my point of view, I couldn't really expect him to have 15 camera crews all filming Lord Fisk on the basis that at some point they'd get the right shot. So we had to do it that way. But we didn't do that. And, and I was very pleased about the fact that, um, you know, when we're in the car, we're in the car and we're going and that's it. And we don't know what's going to happen. Young um, we, has, has I don't talked, know what's going to happen. Young yeah. has talked about the movie as being a kind of love letter to the sort of journalism that you represent. What do you- I haven't heard him say that, but that's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, I, the only reference I've made about letters is that I said, and I can't remember now if I say it in the film, but I try to write my reports like a letter to a friend, like saying, you won't believe what I've just seen today. And I think that Young and I caught the same feelings as we were making this film. I mean, it was his film, not mine. He made the decisions. Uh, but I think we, we caught the same feelings of, well, what's going to happen around the next corner? And we didn't know, of course. Yeah. Uh, none of us did. And uh, we didn't know how the Jewish settler uh, would respond to my questions about Palestine, quote, unquote. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know at all what Amir Haas was going to say about the Israeli war, you know, longer and bigger and taller than the Berlin Wall. Although I had a pretty good idea what she thought of it, because uh, she's an old friend of mine. But um, go ahead, yeah. 
I, I, th I think he, he was really getting at, um, in fact, he has said that you're part of a lost generation of reporters. Oh, God, yeah. I've heard this sort is of like stuff. Real reporting. You know, when I first went to the Middle East in 1976 as a correspondent, everyone wanted to interview me about the death of the foreign correspondent. There would be no more foreign correspondents. It was over. It was TV now. Right? Now, of course, you have the internet or blogs or websites. <clears throat> and in fact, there are more reporters in the Middle East now than I've ever seen before in my life. And I don't think there's anything particularly old fashioned. What may be a little bit dated about what I do is that I stay away from websites and blogs and Googles. I'm not interested. I want to go to the scene of a rally, a battle, a speech, a tragedy. I want to see it with my own eyes and talk to the people there and note it down in my notebook and have my pen with me and record it. And I've got all my notebooks on file and archived. But just a few minutes before we came on air, I was going back to the notebook I used to take notes for the story that I was quoting from on page 1,669. Um, so, you know, I, in that sense, I think that I'm still trying to be what I was when I did my PhD, which, by the way, um, Irish neutrality in the Second World War. There's a connection for you. Uh, so it involved World War II. Um, and that was, you know, an academic who's looking for research papers and documents at a time when some of the people involved in the Second World War were still alive, you know, some of the decision makers. Um, and so I'm, I suppose I'm trying to do what I did in my PhD. Every day I go out for an adventure, which is exciting and sometimes very frightening or dangerous. But it's very nice to come back home again after it's safely. Um, and it's got this, this edge of sort of, it is exciting. There is an excitement about being a foreign correspondent. Uh, Winston Churchill once wrote that there was nothing so exhilarating as to be shot at without effect. Um, of course, as a lot of my colleagues have been shot at with effect and are dead. And as I always remind myself, you know, you've got to think you're going to report a war. You're not going there to die in it. That's not the purpose. You know? mm. um, I said that to quite a few people. Um, but uh, I think that, um, yeah, I, I guess it is a bit out of date. But I think that I always say to people, you know, if you can write a story about Lebanon or Egypt, and say you're in Damascus or somewhere in the Middle East. But if you can write that story from Iceland or from, um, I don't know, Nevada in the United States, what's the point of being in the Middle East? You can just suck in the agency quotes and a few cliches and put the word deadly or, um, you know, or, or, or venomous or something. In, and, and you've written your story from, I don't know, Peru, if you want. And so I think if you're going to be in the region, if you're going to be there and live there, you must go out on the story and see it with your own eyes. Besides the fact that in the Middle East, hardly anyone will tell you anything on the telephone. You've chosen to live, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, and in Beirut in particular. Mm -hmm. What is it about that area that you find so compelling, that area and its people? Yeah, compelling is another of those words I try to avoid, but I've just used it um, downstairs. Uh, I, I suppose it, it, what happened, you see, was that um, I was covering the aftermath of the Portuguese Revolution, 1975-76. And the Civil War had begun in Beirut, a city I knew because I'd been there on a holiday from Belfast, if you can believe it. And um, a correspondent there, I was working for the Times, the London Times, this is pre-Murdoch, pre-Rupert Murdoch. Thank heavens. And um, our correspondent there had just got married and his wife did not want to start her marriage in the Civil War. So Louis Heron, the late but um, sadly uh, foreign editor, wrote me a note which I received on a beach in Portugal saying, I'm offering you the Middle East. And I felt a bit like, you know, a king being offered a state by Winston Churchill. And he said, um, it's, it, it's a great adventure with lots of sunshine. He was right about the sunshine. Um, and so I went to Beirut and suddenly I was in the middle of this horrific civil war. Um, looking back, it was one of the least dangerous wars I was to cover. If you compare it to Bosnia, Algeria, Syria now, it's much more dangerous. Every war I cover tends to be worse in terms of danger than the previous ones. Um, and I think that I suddenly found that um, Lebanon was small enough for you to write a good, strong report 
every day and, and tell people what you thought was really happening, not what the agencies said. Tell people that you think someone is lying through their teeth, because that's what the reader wants to know, after all, or the viewer. Um, and I think that um, then, of course, I, you know, I was traveling out. I was going to the Iran-Iraq war, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, or intervention, as it was called at the time. And suddenly my world got bigger. And I did get the chance to cover Eastern Europe just before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I turned it down. I went to Warsaw. I thought it was immensely cold, and I found a, that the Times office in Warsaw, where I'd worked from, still had a hole in the wall made by a Nazi tank shell in 1944. And I thought, this is enough. I'm going back to Beirut. And I sort of stayed on there. And of course, you start realizing you are covering history. And here I still am after 44 years. And, you know, I feel a bit like one is reading this great novel, War and Peace, Anna Karenina. And you're sitting up late at night and reading and you think, my God, it's gone midnight. Well, I'll just finish this chapter. Just one more chapter. Yeah. And before you know it, you see the, the dawn in between the curtains. You've read the whole night because you can't give it up. Because you want to know what happens next, Judy. And that is the answer to your question. I will never know eventually what happens, of course. But I want to know what's going to happen tomorrow.